I do have some good news for you. Um, uh, not a lot, but I've got some. This is, um, reminds me of, of uh, my home near uh, where I live. Um, uh, this is on Vancouver Island. It's a sculpture um, carved from one solid piece of marble from northern Vancouver Island. And obviously, um, it's a beautiful figure. It's called Spirit of Earth. And it's very much in the tradition of the uh, First Nations, the indigenous peoples in our region. Um, uh, and there, respect and reverence for, for Mother Earth. In Canada, as in the uh, United States, the, uh, the indigenous people are really wonderful. They're really leading, they're out there in the street leading the opposition to the, um, to the monster of the fossil fuel industry. So we respect them a lot for doing that. Okay, so this is, um, this is my title. Um, it's funny, a uh, Real Truth um, conference, because for some years now I've been referring to uh, global climate disruption as the terrible truth. And I've been trying to uh, communicate the terrible truth uh, as best I can on uh, websites. I got several websites and uh, also on my papers. So that's one of my websites, and I, I manage that. That's the Climate Emergency Institute. Uh, um, uh, it's a bit busy. I'll be putting the presentation on the website. I, I use the websites pretty well as my uh, sort of reference library. But you'll see I'm featuring the uh, IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their October 2018 1.5 degree C um, report which I was an expert reviewer of. Now, this is definitely the best of the IPCC reports. Their first report was way back in 1990, and this received, uh, this was very good because it received a lot of publicity from the media. It seemed that the IPCC finally uh, got um, the truth um, of climate change across to the public, across to the media. So there's the book. I, I co-wrote the book with Elizabeth Woodworth. She's a lady about my same vintage. And um, we wrote the book for a couple of reasons, I guess. One was that we became aware that although there were people, there were professors and people uh, working on the uh, criminal moral aspect of climate change because it's an atrocious moral insult, but we, but we couldn't find a book on it. So we decided, decided, okay, we should write a book. The other thing was we were both very aware uh, one of the very good things that is happening with respect to climate disruption, and that is uh, the young people um, uh, coming to the fore and actually taking legal actions against the fossil fuel monster. So uh, in, uh, in the United States we have our Children's Trust, and they've been, uh, they're suing the uh, federal government um, under the public trust doctrine for not looking after their climate, their environment. Um, uh, they're actually, uh, as I'll show you, they're, um, uh, they're leaving the planet in one heck of a state for, for these children, which is really a terrible thing. So our Children's Trust is being so far very successful in the United States, but the um, Trump administration keeps on and on and on, sending more and more demands for information, so um, uh, uh, they need all the help that we can give them. Um, so that's our Children's Trust in the state. The other, the other really good uh, group in the states that's having a lot of success is called the Climate Mobilization. And they're doing a city-by-city city, uh, climate emergency uh, project. In 2001, I, I think it was, I heard uh, Bill McDonough uh, speak. He was at a conference um, uh, that uh, David Suzuki was at and some other people. David Suzuki, a famous Canadian, um, uh, doing a TV show, for one of the most successful TV shows on nature. So Bill McDonough, who is an architect and a green architect, he started his, um, 
his talk with, uh, with this question. And the question is, how do we love all the children of all the species for all time? And uh, as the years have gone by, I think I've become uh, able to understand that question more and more and more and more. So the other question now is, can we rescue the future? Um, yeah, we've got to literally save the planet. But that's people and, and other animals and the birds and the fish. Can we rescue the future? This is a 15-year-old young lady who um, has had a, a good amount of good publicity recently. She's called Greta Thunberg and she's from Sweden. And she's the young lady that started the uh, uh, strike at her school because she was uh, wanting to get her message out that Sweden was not looking after her atmosphere, her environment, well enough. Now that's interesting because Sweden is, is really at the uh, lead. It's certainly one of the best countries with respect to their, uh, their target, their emissions targets. But Greta's quite right. It's nothing like good enough. Um, uh, none of the industrialized nations, uh, they all have these emissions targets that they file with the United Nations. And none of them have a target which is even close to the old, uh, now abandoned, two degree C limit, um, let alone uh, close to the 1.5 degree C limit. Um, just a quick uh, mention that for years and years and years we've had this two degree C global warming limit, which is pretty well for a long time. It's been realized by many people that it's a, it's a limit for catastrophe. So it's very good that the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the scientists have uh, come solidly behind the 1.5 degree C limit. So that's really, really important. We now have a, have a limit which um, uh, is potentially a survivable limit. So uh, there she is at uh, what's called COP24. Um, ever since 1990, there has been an annual United Nations climate conference. And uh, here we are last December we, in Poland. We had the 24th. And um, people talked and talked and talked. And documents went round and round and round. And as usual in these conferences, nothing got decided. That's Greta at the... Um, I think probably just a week ago at the World Economic Forum. Um, watch one of her YouTube. She is absolutely amazing. Um, uh, she knows how to tell the truth very directly, very quickly. And um, uh, we're probably going to see a lot more young people like Greta. Um, that's what my guess is. Uh, at, the, um, at the COP24, you may have read that, that a bad Thoroughly, thoroughly bad thing happened. The 1.5 degree C um, report by the IPCC, the IPC does, C does the reports and then they routinely um, go to the United Nations next climate conference and they form the scientific basis of that conference. This has been going on since 1990. At COP24, the um, the arrangers of the conference um, uh, went through the formalities of tabling the 1.5 degrees C conference and it was, it was blocked by a group of nation, um, uh, countries. It was blocked by Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Russia, and of course now the United States. And uh, this really uh, was terribly annoying, to put it mildly. It ruined the conference, which of course is what these countries wanted to happen. And, um, but the good thing was that the media picked up on it. So we're not making very much progress with regards to these um, cumbersome ways in which we do things. Now here's something very, very good from the United Nations. 
Um, you may remember um, our last uh, Secretary General was Ban Ki-moon, and he was a star on climate change. He really, really was great. So when his time was up and I heard he was going to be replaced by somebody, I thought, oh my gosh, I, you know, I hope he's as good as Ban Ki-moon on climate. So this is Antonio Guterres, who's a, uh, uh, luckily he's our present UN Secretary General, and he's just great. He gets climate change. So in May, he made this uh, statement that um, uh, it, you know, it was a an Austria World Summit that he made the statement that climate change is an existential threat, meaning it's a threat to our survival, and that's to most life on the planet, and there's no question about that, I'll be talking about that, including and especially humankind. And then he went on to um, talk about the great renewable energy which is coming online, but pointing out that in order to survive climate disruption, we have to end the age of fossil fuels. It's not enough to bring on all of this wonderful renewable energy. Um, that has to replace the fossil fuel energy. One of the things that um, I became interested in very early on, on climate disruption, was food security, or rather food insecurity, as it is now. The focus is on climate change has been very much on sea level rise, and that's certainly understandable. But long before we have our cities um, having to be moved, long before we're going to suffer uh, disastrous impacts, they've started already, on our crop yields. So that's another website that I have on, uh, on, on climate change and food security. Now, so here's my wish. I sort of um, thought, okay, last night, put this together last night. If I had one wish, what would I do? So I thought, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to represent Mother Earth, Greta, and all the children in the world, our children of trust. I'd like to represent them in a case of unprecedented ever crime and the greatest evil ever of annihilation by fracking because these people and corporations are fracking our planet to death. And I'd like to bring the case against the multinational investment banks who are financing the, frac the fracking. Exxon gets financed 80% with its fracking operations. Against the multinational fossil fuel corporations who are fracking our planet to death, of course. Also, I'd like to bring it against governments that are still subsidizing fossil fuel corporations. And you'd never believe it, but over the past couple of years, that's increased again. And it amounts to trillions of dollars. So that, that's a terrible and great evil, obviously. And uh, of course, I'd like to bring it against the politicians who are enabling the fracking, who are really representing the fossil fuel corporations. They're not representing the people at all. They're certainly not representing the children. They're certainly not representing the future. So that's just a, a dream. So we do have some climate change good news. And this is it. Um, in 2019, is going to be the year of the vegan. And this was published no less than in The Economist. So yes, in one of the two main aspects of climate disruption, we really are making great, great, great progress. So here's uh, Antonio Guterres again. And he spoke in September at the United Nations and he warned again of the direct existential threat of global climate disruption and said that the climate is nearing the point of no return. And that is unquestionably true. Of course, the UN Director General gets briefed by the best scientists, um, but I'm well aware of the fact that what he says is the truth. Now, um, uh, last night, I checked the uh, NOAA site, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration site, and uh, I was pleased to see that it was up again because all the sites that I use um, have been down. They've been closed because the United States government had not been operating. So, hey, we got a government here again. That's nice. 
So um, uh, uh, we have now hit 410 parts per million, which is, to me, just hard to believe. It just seemed like yesterday that it was 410 parts per million, 350 parts per million right along the bo um, near the bottom there um, uh, is the safe level. And um, as you can see, this is um, carbon dioxide concentration from 1970. You can see unquestionably it's accelerating. This is the other big one. This is methane. Methane is very important, um, uh, particularly because of the livestock meat industry, which is the big source, or one of the biggest sources of methane. Not the only one. Um, uh, growing rice is actually another source of methane under global warming, because rice is um, uh, grown in an artificial wetland. And with global warming, those artificial wetlands growing the rice are emitting more methane. So um, uh, the, um, the 800,000 year limit of these greenhouse gases, we know from the ice core, um, the 800,000 year limit for CO2 was 300 parts per million, it's now at 410. On methane, the limit of a million years is 800 parts per million. It's now 1,870 parts per million. This my friends, is climate insanity. And this is going up extremely rapidly. So that's a little bit of the academic stuff. And yes, the issue today is the survival of humanity and most of life. That's what it is. Um, uh, this is a, a conference put on by the Hampshire College in 2014 for, for Earth Day. Now, Global climate disruption uh, is seldom linked to other things, um, the way that the science approaches it. This is coming on top of already the sixth mass extinction of life in our world. And that mass extinction is accelerating, and that's due to our industrial world and uh, corruption and lack of international law and regulations. You know, I uh, picked out my book, the classic by Richard Leakey, called The Sixth Extinction, and I was horrified to realize he wrote it in 1996. So one of the things I'm going to be pointing out in this presentation is how long those who are responsible for governing us and looking after us and our planet, how long they have known that we were headed for a cataclysm. So the sixth extinction was established in 1996. Um, uh, the team at Stanford um, did the definitive research, which was published uh, two years ago. And um, uh, their title was The Biological Annihilation. This is a scientific paper. The Biological Annihilation um, Assessed by Vertebrate Species. And so the reason, of course, main reason for the sixth mass extinction is that we have, you're going to hear me say accelerating a lot. We have accelerating tropical forest destru destruction, so we're losing the tropical forests um, everywhere. And because the biodiversity, the life is so rich there, this is the sixth mass extinction. But the research finds that we are losing life and species uh, everywhere, in all bioregions. It's not just the tropical forests, bad enough though that is. It's also the uh, coastal and the wetlands all over the world. I decided to um, talk a little bit about something that I don't normally go into, but there's some very recent research on this, and it's nothing if not interesting. This is the end Permian mass extinction, the time when Earth nearly died, and it was a long, long time ago, 250 million years ago. So one has to be rather careful not to make parallels with today's situation with something so long ago. But the scientists have actually made that link now. 
And here's a headline, uh, Global Warming Mirrors Earth's Largest Extinction Ever. Climate change was behind Earth's largest extinction. We're on the same path as the world's biggest extension, and this is the University of Washington. And the end Permian uh, went over a long time, and uh, we lost on this planet, life lost, 99% of all marine species and 70% of terrestrial species. It was an extinction that started in the oceans and then spreads to the land. Um, uh, the, us on the land, um, the oceans don't need us, but we on the land need the oceans for our survival. The marine scientists are always like reminding us about that. Uh, actually, this same research, um, uh, they were, this um, uh, University of Washington, they weren't the only team to come to this conclusion. Um, a Chinese-led team here uh, came to the same conclusion that it was a catastroph catas catastrophic impact on the oceans that started things off. And uh, they say it was uh, happened in a geological instant of 30,000 years. Well, uh, that seems to be a long time to me. The scientists who revealed the cause of the great dying mass extinction called for action to halt climate change. I hope we're going to see a lot more of this. I hope that the scientists like Dr. James Hansen are going to come out of their offices and uh, talk to the media and um, tell everybody uh, what this emergency is. We really need that. So um, uh, they've said that we've really got to respond immediately because of the similarities between this Permian mass extinction and what industrial civilization is doing with its pollution today. Um, the ocean temperature rose uh, 10 degrees C in the Permian mass extinction, which is a lot. So, um, this uh, scientific discussion on the Permian has been going on for a long time, uh, but the scientists have now come together and they, uh, they know what caused it. It was started by CO2 emissions from these volcanoes in Siberia. That led to ocean warming, ocean heating. That led to ocean deoxygenation. And at the same time, the oceans were being acidified. Sound familiar? CO2 emissions, ocean warming, ocean acidification. Yeah. So th these same things are happening today. As I say, the Permian was a long, long time ago. Um, the levels that are happening today are way lower than they were at the Permian, but all of these levels are accelerating. Um, this is a presentation that I prepared for the um, European Geoscience Union conference last year, and um, it's pretty dramatic now that I can put all of these data sets together and people just have to look at them and they can see it. Everything's accelerating. The things are going down <laughs> are accelerating as well as things going up. In addition to that, in addition to the fact that um, all of those data sets are accelerating, we have feedback emissions. And feedback carbon emissions are beginning to kick in. And that's putting more carbon into the atmosphere. And the the amount of carbon that could be put into the atmosphere by these feedbacks, which are caused by global warming, is ginormous. Um, uh, this is the permafrost feedback. And permafrost, the scientists have now discovered, contains twice as much carbon as all the carbon in the atmosphere. And therefore, uh, Antonio Guterres in September this year said this, if we do not change course by 2020, we risk missing the point where we can avoid climate change runaway with disastrous consequences for people and all the natural systems that sustain us. Now, 2020, um, this has been around, everybody's in the field of climate change has known about this since the 2014 fifth assessment. 
which um, made it very clear that 2020 was the absolute limit to the time when global emissions had to be put into decline. That can be done very, very easily. All that has to happen is for the uh, governments to stop subsidizing fossil fuels and killing our future. That's really all that has to happen. The power of the market is such that we're getting lots of investment, um, uh, investment on a par with fossil fuel energy, with renewable energy. So you can imagine that that would pretty well solve the problem. Yes, we should be taxing carbon, putting a price on carbon, obviously. Um, in actual fact, this goes back to the 2007 fourth assessment report that said to avoid two degrees C and all the scientists, I remember very well, were very definite about this. We had to reverse our increasing emissions by 2015 to 2020. So we're there. We're on the last year now. We really are on the last year. And so um, I mentioned the acceleration and I mentioned the feedback emissions that are kicking in. There are many huge sources, this is something that I present on a lot, there are many huge sources of feedback emissions, carbon stored relatively safely until now in the surface of the planet and deep in the oceans. So there's just half a dozen of them. They're potentially all huge feedbacks. And the problem with them is, of course, they're caused by the same thing, which is global surface warming. So they're going to occur in, a, in some time scale together, a time scale enough so that they will be inter-reinforcing. They will be increasing each other as the warming increases and increases. And that's what um, this term runaway means. And that's an environmentalist term, it go, goes back to the 90s. It, it, it's not a scientific term. The, the scientists tend to avoid this um, worst of all um, end of the planet scenarios. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty scary, but you know, um, if you go to the doctor and you, you don't feel a little bit off the weather and he get, gives you a checkup and you uh, go and you have your blood tests and um, you visit him and he just hums and haws and asks you, you know, did you have a good game of golf today and stuff like that. And he said, well, well, well you know, what, what, what my test like, doctor? Oh, don't worry about that. Let me worry about it. You know, um, uh, no, 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 he's going to badger his doctor until his doctor tells him, because <laughs> he wants to know how bad it is, right? That's what we all want to know, you know, how is my heart? How are my kidneys, right? Okay, he doesn't want his doctor to say, don't worry, I'll look after it. Which I'm afraid is what's happening with the, with the climate and the planet right now. So we have <coughs> unprecedented, <coughs> abrupt, accelerating atmospheric carbon dioxide. So if we look at carbon dioxide alone, we have enough information to know that we're in a dire emergency and that we have to respond immediately. And that's because, of course, carbon dioxide causes the vast majority of global warming and all of the ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is accelerating. You don't have to be an expert to see from uh, this image, uh, this graph, that atmospheric carbon dioxide is accelerating. We should have it on a level plane. We should have had it stabilized level years ago. This is from the Scripps Oceanographic Institute. And CO2, as I mentioned, has hit 410 parts per million now. The CO2 level in the atmosphere is ocean heat. It is surface warming, and it is ocean acidification. 